story one of a changed man and other tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales a changed man and other tales by thomas hardy story one a changed man chapters one through four chapter one the person who next to the actors themselves chanced to know most of their story lived just below top of town as the spot was called in an old substantially built house distinguished among its neighbours by having an oriel window on the first floor whence could be obtained a raking view of the high street west and east the former including laura's dwelling the end of the town avenue hard by in which were played the odd pranks hereafter to be mentioned the port breedy road rising westwards and the turning that led to the cavalry barracks where the captain was quartered looking eastward down the town from the same favoured gazebo the long perspective of houses declined and dwindled till they merged in the highway across the moor the white ribbon of road disappeared over gray's bridge a quarter of a mile off to plunge into innumerable rustic windings shy shades and solitary undulations up hill and down dale for one hundred and twenty miles till it exhibit itself at hyde park corner as a smooth bland surface in touch with a busy and fashionable world to the barracks aforesaid had recently arrived the umth hussars a regiment new to the locality almost before any acquaintance with its members had been made by the townspeople a report spread that they were a crack body of men and had brought a splendid band for some reason or other the town had not been used as the headquarters of cavalry for many years the various troops stationed there having consisted of casual detachments only so that it was with a sense of honour that everybody even the small furniture broker from whom the married troopers hired tables and chairs received the news of their crack quality in those days the hussar regiments still wore over the left shoulder that attractive attachment or frilled half-coat hanging loosely behind like a wounded wing of a bird which was called the police though it was known among the troopers themselves as a sling jacket it added amazingly to their picturesqueness in women's eyes and indeed in the eyes of men also the burgher who lived in the house with the oriel window sat during a great many hours of the day in that projection for he was an invalid and time hung heavily on his hands unless he maintained a constant interest in proceedings without not more than a week after the arrival of the hussars his ears were assailed by the shout of one schoolboy to another in the street below have you heard this about the hussars they are haunted yes a ghost troubles em he has followed em about the world for years a haunted regiment that was a new idea for either invalid or stalwart the listener in the oriel window came to the conclusion that there were some lively characters among the umpthusars he made captain mombry's acquaintance in an informal manner at an afternoon tea to which he went in a wheeled chair one of the very rare outings that the state of his health permitted Mombray showed himself to be a handsome man of twenty-eight or thirty with an attractive hint of wickedness in his manner that was sure to make him adorable with good young women the large dark eyes that lit his pale face expressed this wickedness strongly though such was the adaptability of their rays that one could think they might have expressed sadness or seriousness just as readily if he had had a mind for such an old and deaf lady who was present asked captain mombry bluntly what's this we hear about you they say your regiment is haunted the captain's face assumed an aspect of grave even sad concern yes he replied it is too true some younger ladies smiled till they saw how serious he looked when they looked serious likewise really said the old lady yes we certainly don't wish to say much about it no 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 of course not but uh, how haunted well the thing as i'll call it follows us 
in country quarters or town abroad or at home it's just the same how do you account for it hmm mombray lowered his voice some crime committed by certain of our regiment in past years we suppose dear me how very horrid and singular but as i said we don't speak of it much no no when the hussar was gone a young lady disclosing a long suppressed interest asked if the ghost had been seen by any of the town the lawyer's son who always had the latest borough news said that though it was seldom seen by any one but the hussars themselves more than one townsman and woman had already set eyes on it to his or her terror the phantom mostly appeared very late at night under the dense trees of the town avenue nearest the barracks it was about ten feet high its teeth chattered with a dry naked sound as if they were those of a skeleton and its hip bones could be heard grating in their sockets during the darkest weeks of winter several timid persons were seriously frightened by the object answering to this cheerful description and the police began to look into the matter whereupon the appearances grew less frequent and some of the boys of the regiment thankfully stated that they had not been so free from ghostly visitation for years as they had become since their arrival in casterbridge this playing at ghosts was the most innocent of the amusements indulged in by the choice young spirits who inhabited the lichened red brick building at the top of the town bearing w d and a broad arrow on its coins far more serious escapades levities relating to love wine cards betting were talked of with no doubt more or less of exaggeration that the hussars captain mombre included were the cause of bitter tears to several young women of the town and country is unquestionably true despite the fact that the gaieties of the young men wore a more staring colour in this old-fashioned place than they would have done in a large and modern city chapter two regularly once a week they rode out in marching order returning up the town on one of these occasions the romantic police flapping behind each horseman's shoulder in the soft southwest wind captain mombre glanced up at the oriel a mutual nod was exchanged between him and the person who sat there reading the reader and a friend in the room with him followed the troop with their eyes all the way up the street till when the soldiers were opposite the house in which laura lived that young lady became discernible in the balcony they are engaged to be married i hear said the friend who mombre and laura never so soon yes he'll never marry several girls have been mentioned in connection with his name i am sorry for laura oh but you needn't be they are excellently matched she's only one more she's one more and more still she has regularly caught him she is a born player of the game of hearts and she knew how to beat him in his own practices if there is one woman in the town who has any chance of holding her own and marrying him she is that woman this was true as it turned out by natural proclivity laura had from the first entered heart and soul into military romance as exhibited in the plots and characters of those living exponents of it who came under her notice from her earliest young womanhood civilians however promising had no chance of winning her interest if the meanest warrior were within the horizon it may be that the position of her uncle's house which was her home at the corner of west street nearest the barracks the daily passing of the troops the constant blowing of trumpet calls a furlong from her windows coupled with the fact that she knew nothing of the inner realities of military life and hence idealized it had also helped her mind's original bias for thinking men-at-arms the only ones worthy of a woman's heart captain mombre was a typical prize one whom all surrounding maidens had coveted ached for angled for wept for 
had by her judicious management become subdued to her purpose and in addition to the pleasure of marrying the man she loved laura had the joy of feeling herself hated by the mothers of all the marriageable girls of the neighbourhood the man in the oriel went to the wedding not as a guest for at this time he was but slightly acquainted with the parties but mainly because the church was close to his house partly too for a reason which moved many others to be spectators of the ceremony a subconsciousness that though the couple might be happy in their experiences there was sufficient possibility of their being otherwise to colour the musings of an onlooker with a pleasing pathos of conjecture he could on occasion do a pretty stroke of rhyming in those days and he beguiled the time of waiting by pencilling on a blank page of his prayer-book a few lines which though kept private then may be given here at a hasty wedding triolet if ours be years the twain are blessed for now they solace swift desire by lifelong ties that tether zest if ours be years the twain are blessed do eastern suns slope never west nor pallid ashes follow fire if ours be years the twain are blessed for now they solace swift desire as if however to falsify all prophecies the couple seem to find in marriage the secret of perpetuating the intoxication of a courtship which on mombray's side at least had opened without serious intent during the winter following they were the most popular pair in and about casterbridge nay in south wessex itself no smart dinner in the country houses of the younger and gayer families within driving distance of the borough was complete without their lively presence mrs mombray was the blithest of the whirling figures at the county ball and when followed that inevitable incident of garrison town life an amateur dramatic entertainment it was just the same the acting was for the benefit of such and such an excellent charity nobody cared what provided the play were played and both captain mombray and his wife were in the piece having been in fact by mutual consent the originators of the performance and so with laughter and thoughtlessness and movement all went merrily there was a little backwardness in the bill-paying of the couple but in justice to them it must be added that sooner or later all owings were paid chapter three at the chapel of ease attended by the troops there arose above the edge of the pulpit one sunday an unknown face this was the face of a new curate he placed upon the desk not the familiar sermon book but merely a bible the person who tells these things was not present at that service but he soon learnt that the young curate was nothing less than a great surprise to his congregation a mixed one always for though the hussars occupied the body of the building its nooks and corners were crammed with civilians whom up to the present even the least uncharitable would have described as being attracted thither less by the services than by the soldiery now there arose a second reason for squeezing into an already overcrowded church the persuasive and gentle eloquence of mr sainway operated like a charm upon those accustomed only to the higher and drier styles of preaching and for a time the other churches of the town were thinned of their sitters at this point in the nineteenth century the sermon was the sole reason for church-going amongst a vast body of religious people the liturgy was a formal preliminary which like the royal proclamation in a court of assize had to be got through before the real interest began and on reaching home the question was simply who preached and how did he handle his subject even had an archbishop officiated in the service proper nobody would have cared much about what was said or sung people who had formerly attended in the morning only began to go in the evening and even to the special addresses in the afternoon one day when captain mombray entered his wife's drawing-room filled with hired furniture 
she thought he was somebody else for he had not come upstairs humming the most catching air afloat in musical circles or in his usual careless way what's the matter jack she said without looking up from a note she was writing well not much that i know oh but there is she murmured as she wrote why this cursed new lathe in a sheet i mean the new parson he wants us to stop the band playing on sunday afternoons laura looked up aghast why it is the one thing that enables the few rational beings hereabouts to keep alive from saturday to monday he says all the town flock to the music and don't come to the service and that the pieces played are profane or mundane or inane or something not what ought to be played on sunday of course tis lautman who settles these things lautman was the bandmaster the barrack green on sunday afternoons had indeed become the promenade of a great many townspeople cheerfully inclined many even of those who attended in the morning at mr sainway's service and little boys who ought to have been listening to the curate's afternoon lecture were too often seen rolling upon the grass and making faces behind the more dignified listeners laura heard no more about the matter however for two or three weeks when suddenly remembering it she asked her husband if any further objections had been raised oh mr sainway i forgot to tell you i've made his acquaintance he is not a bad sort of man laura asked if either mombre or some others of the officers did not give the presumptuous curate a good setting down for his interference oh well we've forgotten that he's a stunning preacher they tell me the acquaintance developed apparently for the captain said to her a little later on there's a good deal in sainway's argument about having no band on sunday afternoons after all it is close to his church but he doesn't press his objections unduly i am surprised to hear you defend him it was only a passing thought of mine we naturally don't wish to offend the inhabitants of the town if they don't like it but they do the invalid in the oriel never clearly gathered the details of progress in this conflict of lay and clerical opinion but so it was that to the disappointment of musicians the grief of outwalking lovers and the regret of the junior population of the town and country round the band playing on sunday afternoons ceased in casterbridge barracks square by this time the mombres had frequently listened to the preaching of the gentle if narrow-minded curate for these light-natured hit-or-miss rackety people went to church like others for respectability's sake none so orthodox as your unmitigated worldling a more remarkable event was the sight to the man in the window of captain mombre and mr sainway walking down the high street in earnest conversation on his mentioning this fact to a caller he was assured that it was a matter of common talk that they were always together the observer would soon have learnt this with his own eyes if he had not been told they began to pass together nearly every day hitherto mrs mombre in fashionable walking clothes had usually been her husband's companion but this was less frequent now the close and singular friendship between the two men went on for nearly a year when mr sainway was presented to a living in a densely populated town in the midland counties he bade the parishioners of his old place a reluctant farewell and departed the touching sermon he preached on the occasion being published by the local printer everybody was sorry to lose him and it was with genuine grief that his casterbridge congregation learnt later on that soon after his induction to his benefice during some bitter weather he had fallen seriously ill of inflammation of the lungs of which he eventually died we now get below the surface of things of all who had known the dead curate none grieved for him like the man who on his first arrival had called him a lathe in a sheet mrs mombre had never greatly sympathized with the impressive parson indeed she had been secretly glad that he had gone away to better himself 
he had considerably diminished the pleasures of a woman by whom the joys of earth and good company had been appreciated to the full sorry for her husband in his loss of a friend who had been none of hers she was yet quite unprepared for the sequel there is something that i have wanted to tell you lately dear he said one morning at breakfast with hesitation have you guessed what it is she had guessed nothing that i think of retiring from the army what i have thought more and more of saneway since his death and of what he used to say to me so earnestly and i feel certain i shall be right in obeying a call within me to give up this fighting trade and enter the church what be a parson yes but what should i do be a parson's wife never she affirmed but how can you help it i'll run away rather she said vehemently no you mustn't mombrey replied in the tone he used when his mind was made up you'll get accustomed to the idea for i am constrained to carry it out though it is against my worldly interests i am forced on by a hand outside me to tread in the steps of saneway jack she asked with a calm pallor and round eyes do you mean to say seriously that you are arranging to be a curate instead of a soldier i might say a curate is a soldier of the church militant but i don't want to offend you with doctrine i distinctly say yes late one evening a little time onward he caught her sitting by the dim firelight in her room she did not know he had entered and he found her weeping what are you crying about poor dearest he said she started because of what you have told me the captain grew very unhappy but he was undeterred in due time the town learnt to its intense surprise that captain mombray had retired from the umph hussars and gone to fontal theological college to prepare for the ministry chapter four oh the pity of it such a dashing soldier so popular such an acquisition to the town the soul of social life here and now one should not speak ill of the dead but that dreadful mr saneway it was too cruel of him this is a summary of what was said when captain now the reverend john mombray was enabled by circumstances to indulge his heart's desire of returning to the scene of his former exploits in the capacity of a minister of the gospel a low-lying district of the town which at that date was crowded with impoverished cottagers was crying for a curate and mr mombray generously offered himself as one willing to undertake labours that were certain to produce little result and no thanks credit or emolument let the truth be told about him as a clergyman he proved to be anything but a brilliant success painstaking single-minded deeply in earnest as all could see his delivery was laboured his sermons were dull to listen to and alas too too long even the dispassionate judges who sat by the hour at the bar-parlour of the white hart an inn standing at the dividing line between the poor quarter aforesaid and the fashionable quarter of mombray's former triumphs and hence affording a position of strict impartiality agreed in substance with the young ladies to the westward though their views were somewhat more tersely expressed surely god a'mighty spoiled a good soldier to make a bad parson when he lit up captain mombray into a sharpless the latter knew that such things were said but he pursued his daily labours in and out of the hovels with serene unconcern it was about this time that the invalid in the oriel became more than a mere bowing acquaintance of mrs mombray's she had returned to the town with her husband and was living with him in a little house in the centre of his circle of ministration when by some means she became one of the invalid's visitors after a general conversation while sitting in his room with a friend of both an incident led up to the matter that still rankled deeply in her soul 
her face was now paler and thinner than it had been even more attractive her disappointments having inscribed themselves as meek thoughtfulness on a look that was once a little frivolous the two ladies had called to be allowed to use the window for observing the departure of the hussars who were leaving for barracks much nearer to london the troopers turned the corner of barrack road into the top of high street headed by their band playing the girl i left behind me which was formerly always the tune for such times though it is now nearly disused they came and passed the oriel where an officer or two looking up and discovering mrs mombray saluted her whose eyes filled with tears as the notes of the band waned away before the little group had recovered from that sense of the romantic which such spectacles impart mr mombray came along the pavement he probably had bidden his former brethren-in-arms a farewell at the top of the street for he walked from that direction in his rather shabby clerical clothes and with a basket on his arm which seemed to hold some purchases he had been making for his poorer parishioners unlike the soldiers he went along quite unconscious of his appearance or of the scene around the contrast was too much for laura with lips that now quivered she asked the invalid what he thought of the change that had come to her it was difficult to answer and with a wilfulness that was too strong in her she repeated the question do you think she added that a woman's husband has a right to do such a thing even if he does feel a certain call to it her listener sympathized too largely with both of them to be anything but unsatisfactory in his reply laura gazed longingly out of the window towards the thin dusty line of hussars now smalling towards the melstock ridge i she said who should have been in their van on the way to london am doomed to fester in a hole in durnover lane many events had passed and many rumours had been current concerning her before the invalid saw her again after her leave-taking that day End of story one chapters one through four